please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Thank you. Well, tonight uh, we'll do a roll call and then we just have one item. Uh, be, uh, Liz? Here. Mayor Dickey? Yeah. Vice Mayor Charnow? Here. Council Member Tolis? Here. Council Member Brown? Here. Council Member Magazine? Here. Council Member Friedel? Here. Council Member Spellich? Present. Thank you. Um, before we start, I wanted to just say a few things. Um, we've lost some community leaders uh, over the last uh, month or so, uh, including former Councilman Mike Arshambo and Councilman Ed Key. Um, we express our caring thoughts to and sympathy for their family and friends and our gratitude to these fine people for their service to our community over all the years. Um, we have uh, as our guest Chamber Executive Director Betsy Lavoie, she's going to present the plan for the fair. Council will ask questions um, and, and make comments. And then um, we'll have a half hour of, testimony, of uh, speaker testimony. Um, we have the three minute rule, which is the, which is the usual rule. Please watch for this red light and there's a beep tone um, for when the three minutes is up. If you don't wish to speak or you feel like the, the time is running short, please fill out a card. With your position, our clerk is going to be uh, keeping a, a track and give, will give us a tally. Uh, I'm going to ask for, um, I, I can see this isn't going to happen, but please let's not have disruptions um, uh, to any, you know, let's be respectful to everyone. This is the time to be respectful for everyone. Um, there's a lot of people that want the fair to, to go on, and there's a lot of people that do not want the, uh, the fair to go on. Um, for example, you, we have our vendors, we have our artists. The chamber, they work very hard year after year on this effort. They're experiencing diminished income. They're struggling like many. We're not gonna be up here vilifying or ascribing negative motivations to those who are just trying to make a living and trying to survive. On the other hand, there's a lot of people that want to attend who are eager to get a semblance of normalcy. I think we're all feeling that right now want fun back in their lives. They know the weather's gonna be beautiful and they're gonna to wanna to get out and enjoy it. And another group are those that feel that this is a risk right now. Maybe they've had family or friends that were personally affected by this disease and feel we, maybe we can hold off for now to keep the numbers in check while the inevitable treatments and likely preventative measures become reality. So we're all here in good faith. We all have, we all have love for our community. And no matter which one of those perspectives are of yours, let's please begin uh, by listening to the Director Lavoie, who will uh, put forth what their plan is, and uh, we'll move forward respectfully. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dickey. Vice Mayor Sharnow, Town Council members, and the town staff, I thank you for the opportunity to share our health and safety plan. I speak on behalf of the Fountain Hills Chamber of Commerce for the Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts. You should have all received our health and safety packet um, previously today via email, but also a paper packet in front of you. And I wanted to start off and share with you that there are other Valley events that are proceeding in Maricopa County um, before our show even. The first one is the Maricopa County Home Show. It's October 16th through the 18th inside, indoors at Westworld in Scottsdale. There's the Downtown Phoenix Farmer's Market on October 3rd and October 10th. There's also the Litchfield Park Festival of Arts. They are proceeding with their Arts and Crafts Festival and did get their local government approval. There's also the Phoenix Pride Parade, a gay, parade, uh, gay pride parade and festival November 7th, the weekend before our event. They will have 100 and 50 entertainment options on six different stages and over 300 vendor booths. Many of these events you'll see are quite, quite large. Um, as I said, you should have all received our public health and safety plan. It not only includes our health and safety plan, it also includes our artist vendor exhibitor waiver, examples of our signage, as well as our code of conduct and expectations for guests that day. 
We will make that available on our website and all of our social media platforms for the next six weeks if allowed to proceed, and I'll be going through it in detail tonight. As a leader in the industry for 46 years, the first Fountain Festival was in 1974. The Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts understands the impact and importance that our fairs have on our local businesses, the economy, and our community. We are determined and passionate to move forward if allowed to do so through these challenging times with utmost responsibility to the health and safety for all. We are prepared to implement strict physical distancing procedures as well as detailed and thorough public health and safety plan. Through these new procedures, local businesses and artisans will have the opportunity to generate and earn new business, boost our local economy, and artisans will have, I'm sorry, boost our local economy, and the purpose of this plan is to outline and describe the procedures the Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts will implement in downtown Fountain Hills to safely host this retail festival. The Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts is a retail arts festival that follows all requirements set forth by Governor Ducey's retail guidelines and the CDC's guidelines for considerations for events and gatherings. All guidelines have been drawn directly from the CDC, the World Health Organization, and the Arizona Department of Health Services and governmental guidelines. Changes will be made and adjusted upon recommendations and updates by governmental bodies as well as the CDC, WHO, and the Arizona Department of Health Services. The Fall Festival is committed to the health and safety, particularly uh, for this event, for COVID-19. The COVID-19 safety plan was prepared by the Fountain Hills Chamber of Commerce in cooperation with and with input from the town of Fountain Hills to minimize public exposure to the virus. This COVID-19 safety plan has been prepared and will be implemented in accordance with the CDC and prevention guidelines for considerations for events and gatherings that was updated July 7th of 2020 and in accordance with all applicable state and local requirements. The purpose of this plan is the protection of the artists, the protection of the volunteers, the protection of the vendors, the protection of the exhibitors, and of course the protection of the attendees from exposure of COVID-19. Face coverings are required for all guests, all staff, all volunteers, all artists, all vendors, and all exhibitors according to the Maricopa County mask ordinance and will be strictly enforced. <clears throat> Our action plan. So I'm going to go through this in detail and please if you have any questions write them down and I'll make sure to answer them at the end. So per the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention guidance under all circumstances the Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts will achieve to the will adhere to the following guidance. All, like, like I just mentioned, I really want to reiterate, all staff and volunteers, artisans, vendors, exhibitors, and guests will wear face cat coverings according to the mask ordinance from Maricopa County. Our signage will be placed throughout the show. This is an example of our signage. We have 13 different signs, and I do have a site plan map that I'll show you next. And these are reminders of all of the different um, reminders that they need for to stay safe during this virus. Of course, the mask ordinance. Of course, increased sanitation procedures are in place throughout the event. Complimentary hand sanitizing stations, complimentary hand washing stations, six foot apart distancing stickers, as well as the symptoms to be watchful for. Uh, every sign will have, if you come into contact with someone with COVID-19 in the past 21 days or are at higher risk, please stay home by participating and or uh, visiting the Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts, you voluntarily assume all risks related to the exposure of COVID-19. We plan to make all of our communication plan available for the next six weeks if allowed to proceed. This site map is a layout of what we intend to have at the show. This is all new for the show except for the star, which is the chamber information booth and the restrooms, which we've always provided. So what you will see, there are 13 new COVID safety reminder signs. Those are the orange spots or the orange dots on the, on the map. There are seven designated sanitizing stations and every vendor booth is encouraged to have their own hand sanitation, which in essence is over 400 sanitation stations at the event. We added five hand washing stations at every bathroom. 
Previously, the porta johns just had the hand sanitizers attached to the porta john, but we added hand washing stations to those areas. We've added a private security detail with two to seven personnel. We've doubled our security. We've always had 24 seven security at the event from Wednesday through Sunday. We typically have 12 security personnel. We've added an additional 13 for over 25 security personnel at the event, plus the private security, plus the MCSO that we already secure for this event. To continue our action plan, we will have daily and frequent COVID-19 prevention announcement reminders on our speaker system that you can hear very audibly throughout the event, reminding attendees, vendors, and artisans to socially distance. Like I mentioned, we'll have complimentary hand sanitizer stations. We'll have complimentary hand washing stations. We are removing our event programs to cut down on any contact points. We are removing our purple people volunteers to reduce booth to booth volunteer traffic. We are implementing six feet apart stickers on the ground in front of common areas such as bathrooms, the information booth, and food booths. We do have a waiver that we are requiring all artists, all exhibitors, and all vendors to sign this year for this event. And I will read it to you now. It states, by electronically agreeing to this waiver, I agree to the following terms at the 2020 Fall Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts. I will not open my booth for customers if I am exhibiting signs of potential COVID-19 symptoms such as fatigue, coughing, fever, aches. I will take my temperature daily before opening of the show, and if my temperature is over 100 degrees, I will not open my booth for the day. I will provide a clean and sanitized booth for customers, which includes wiping down and sanitizing touched and shared surfaces such as payment systems, counters, and merchandise. I will use contactless payment options if able to do so and understand the chamber has provided instructions to proceed with contactless payment opportunities. I will provide some type of partition between my booth and my neighbor to cut down on shared germs and the ability for customers to walk freely within the booth from booth to booth. I will wear a mask during all hours of the show according to the Maricopa mask ordinance. If I have a medical condition that prohibits me from wearing a mask, I will post publicly. I will keep traffic in my booth to a minimum at one time, 10 people or less, and enforce the Maricopa mask ordinance within my booth. I will post the PDF sign provided to me stating the Maricopa mask mask ordinance and booth maximum occupancy and I will respect the event staff and volunteers who are responsible for enforcing the above conditions. If an artisan, vendor, or exhibitor does not sign the waiver, they are not able to open at our show. We are encouraging artisans and vendors to open the backside of their booth to allow for air circulation. We are uh, physical distancing of at least six feet will be encouraged through directional traffic flow. How we intend to manage this, you know, the large uh, chalk that you see, especially for contracting, it's really bright uh, spray chalk. We are going to have directional arrows up and down throughout the show and it will be obvious for direction, uh, directional traffic flow. We have approximately 100 less vendors and artisans that we typically have for this event and are able to spread out because of that. In order to proceed with the event, it was recommended by the town staff and mayor to eliminate opportunities for gathering. We took that advice and we have elimination of certain events to discourage gathering and to encourage continual flow of traffic including but not limited to canceling our Saturday evening artist party removal of the political row, canceling the beer garden, and canceling all entertainment. We also, as a chamber, are providing virtual check-in in, in order to discourage gathering and long lines at the chamber information booth. We are removing our artist packets during check-in. Like I said, we are doubling our security personnel for enforcement, and we are providing a complimentary disposable face mask if needed to attendees upon request. I have a stay informed section of our communication packet and it's just to share with everyone that we do already have a fountainhillsartfairs.com website and we will make sure to alter policies and procedures based on trends and mandates put forth by local state and national government and health officials and for the most up to date information it will be visible and available on our website. 
We also created a code of conduct and expectations for all guests that we will take the next six weeks to continually promote on social media and on our website. So the guests who attend our fair are not surprised uh, by the expectations. And I'm going to read them to you now. Number one, face coverings required at all times per Maricopa County mask mandate. The Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts is offering a complimentary disposable face mask to guests if needed and while supplies last. Complimentary hand sanitizer stations as well as complimentary hand washing stations will be available. Number two, it is encouraged that vehicles park one car space in between to maintain safe six feet physical distancing if possible. Number three, wash hands frequently with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or use 60% alcohol based hand sanitizer often. Number four, if you are feeling ill, showing any cold or flu like symptoms, and or have had a temperature of 100.4 or more, do not attend the Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts. Number five, always sneeze and or cough into a tissue and immediately throw the tissue in the trash. Number six, we suggest not taking any printed material, rather offer the vendor, artisan, exhibitor, your email address to receive their information electronically. Number seven, it is recommended you use your own pen to fill out any information or to proceed with payments. Number eight, avoid physical contact, including handshakes, high fives, embraces, etc. Number nine, never touch your face. <clears throat> Number 10, be mindful of everyone's personal space. Practice physical distancing of at least six feet. Number 11, if gloves are worn, please use 60% alcohol based hand sanitizer often or replace gloves often. Number 12, if you are at higher risk of developing severe illness from COVID-19, or you are an individual in contact with higher risk patients, for example, residents in your same household or long-term care facility employees, et cetera, please do not attend the Fall Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts. And number 13, if you have been in contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19 in the past 21 days, or has exhibited symptoms of COVID-19 within 21 days of the event, please do not attend the Fall Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts. Like we mentioned, there'll be enhanced and thorough cleaning and sanitization of the venue common areas, including restrooms, information booth, and seating areas. The above guidance is being given in consideration of the World Health Organization, the Arizona Health uh, and Government officials, and the CDC guidelines set forth for large events and mass gatherings. Like I mentioned, our website already has information regarding our regular procedures for complimentary parking, our regular FAQs, and all previously necessary information. But we will make sure to add all of the public health and safety guidelines, the code of conduct and expectations from the guests that I shared, as well as our entire communication packet. I do also want to share, because many might not know this if they don't have school-aged children, I have two young children who attend our local Fountain Hills Unified School District, and I wanted to share the most recent superintendent newsletter with you, which states full in-person learning will begin October 19th, which is almost a month before our event. Driving their decision is the improvement of our metrics on the Maricopa County Department of Public Health dashboard, including and indicating we have improved in all three categories over the past three weeks. This event is pivotal in helping our local economy begin the recovery process. Our two art fairs directly give over $80,000 to our local nonprofit community between our two shows who've had no way to fundraise or support their organizations for almost nine months by the time we have this November show. This amount is direct contributions and does not even include the sales tax that is collected by the town of Fountain Hills from the fairs for the hotels, the restaurants, the gas stations, shopping at our local businesses and grocery stores that all desperately need this increased revenue opportunity. We at the Fountain Hills Chamber of Commerce advocate on behalf of our business community and our nonprofit community. We conducted a 48 hour survey that started on Thursday after we learned that we would be um, coming before you today to ensure we are in fact representing our community and proceeding 
uh, with this event based on their desires and their wishes. And this is the results of the survey. We had 65% in favor without hearing of any of the public and safety health plan. We had 12% unsure and we had 24% against. And again, that was before any of this information was laid out. And I'm open to taking any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I will ask the council what they want to ask you. I'll have comments and then we'll hear from the public. Councilman. Thank you, Mayor. So about every other statement you have in here is you have to wear a mask, but on October 6th, I understand the supervisors, county supervisors are going to look at this ordinance one more time. And if, if they give us a green flag, will you rewrite this or how will you address that? Thank you, Councilmember Brown. We, uh, on purpose, said according to the Maricopa County mask mandate, because if that changes, then we will change accordingly. Well thought out. Uh, then two quick questions. Uh, how many vendors do we have signed up this year? Great question. What is typical for this year is 450 at this time. Right now we have 315. And you have six weeks left. Yes. Do you have any indication, do you suppose you might get up to the 450 mark again? We have 120 who are waiting to hear from our safety plan and to hear if it's approved by the town again. Thank you very much. Other questions, comments? Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Betsy, going back to the uh, plan, the layout, the uh, map of the avenue and so yes. forth. Um, I know you detailed the uh, extra security over the three, three to four to five days, what have you. Uh, I'm seeing the one private security spot there at the avenue and uh, Verde River. I'm just wondering as far as the uh, crowd control and the direction. I mean, all, all of us who've been out there know that, you know, usually you know, there's one crowd going this way on, on, on the booth and the other side's coming down this way and the middle is kind of free for all. So, I mean, are you going to have people at all of the uh, beginning of the arrows and that and the intersections and uh, and the, the crossover where the chamber booth is is that how you plan to do it or so typically our 12 security that are hired 24 7 from Wednesday through Sunday typically they roam throughout the event so instead of having 12 we will have 25 roaming throughout the event we will have signage placed at all of those points and we can even add signage um, I, it'll be very obvious, the directional flow arrows. However, we can have additional signage that states, please follow the arrows and only walk in the direction of the arrows, if I, necessary. I mean, I, I guess I would recommend maybe having at least one stationary person at those places only, instead of roaming only, you know, I go to the grocery store and I know at least Safeway has arrows and I, I violated them just because I just don't, pay attention and so when you have a larger crowd I think it might be a little bit more uh, difficult but uh, just just my suggestion absolutely and with the addition of 13 which happens to be the same number of all of the signs that we're posting I don't see it a problem to have stationary security at those points and then to piggyback on Councilman Brown's question so you're still you could take more artists in over the next few weeks pending tonight and and we everything could. else Okay, and then um, I don't know. Maybe this is for Grady, but uh, if it say we say yes tonight, I mean, and for some reason the numbers just skyrocket. I mean, is this something we can withdraw or cancel, or we don't really have that ability, or the chamber doesn't have that ability with their artists? Um, so, um, as the staff report indicates, um, if something happened with the numbers and it becomes um, very obvious that this is a worsening condition for the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, it, did, it does state that it may be necessary for the found fair to be counseled. Now, this would be something that wouldn't be done in a vacuum. I mean, this would be something that we would be have, um, the mayor, myself, the staff would have to kind of talk about this internally and then also get together with, um, with uh, Betsy and, and her staff. Um, again, part of the challenge with this whole pandemic is trying to forecast the future, and this is six, seven weeks out right now. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, things at stake, particularly as you get closer to the event. And so um, that's, I would hope we wouldn't have to be in that situation. Um, right. And I, right, I don't right. have an easy answer for you, as you could tell. Well, yeah, and we don't necessarily want to be in that position. I was just kind of, you know, kind of conjecturing. I, I, do, I do think we have to have a contingency, and we'll have to work with um, Betsy and her team on figuring out what that might be. There's a lot, I mean, they've taken money from folks. They have people that are probably coming cross country. You know, it might be difficult to communicate with. So it, it's, it would be a challenge to council, I would think, going forward. I do want to share that when we released the applications on May 18th, we did have a COVID-19 statement that stated if the local government, um, for any reason, we were not able to proceed, then, and we had to cancel the event, that all artisans and exhibitors would get 100% of their money back. So we, you know, have not just proceeded as if there was not, you know, we proceeded with caution, in other words, every step of the way. I know the um, governor had a press conference late last week and, um, you know, obviously people have different opinions on how this has all been handled since March or what have you, but uh, one of his quotes was, you know, what you should look at is our positivity rate, our hospital capacity, our ICU capacity, which are all, are all at all time lows, low being the positive number that we want. And of course he contributes, there's been a slight uptick, the last slight uptick in September, but uh, of course, he uh, uh, attributes that to uh, increased uh, testing and more efficient testing, but uh, I know that's up to argument. But uh, I think uh, since July, when we reached our peak, I mean, we have been on a uh, really good downward trajectory, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Betsy. Um Outstanding presentation, and you clearly have thought this through in, in detail, and it's very impressive. Um, there are a couple of things. Um, on the vendor waiver, it says that uh, booths will be wiped down and sanitized, um, uh, shared surfaces, payments, and so on. Um, I have a concern about how you go about enforcing that. And in that same vein, it says 10 people or less in a booth. I have a 10 by 15 booth. I guess 80% maybe have a 10 by 10 booth. Mm -hmm. That means people are on top of each other. Um, if you want to go ahead, then I'll go on with a couple more. Yes, so the booths are 11 by 14, and all of you who have attended our fair know that use, most of the booths handle three or four people max, and people do not crowd into that tiny space. We are just having to put a maximum of no more than 10 people in a booth because there are some exhibitors and artisans who buy three or four booths that are larger. So we have the maximum amount of people of 10 or less within a booth. But quite frankly, most of the booths will not even accommodate more than three or four at a time. And people, especially right now, are not going to crowd in and try to put in more in, a, in that cramped space. The artisans that we've heard from are desperate to be able to have the opportunity to, for some, it's their sole income. And so when you ask about enforcement, um, I, I can't speak for all 315 of the artisans, but they are pretty much all willing to do whatever it takes at this point in order to move forward with this fair, including posting the mask mandate, including keeping and enforcing the amount of people within their booth, and including hand sanitation and sanitizing their own booths. My concern for that, and uh, first of all, in a 10 by 15 booth, if I have four people, they're not six feet apart. They're practically touching each other because I have tables with things and so on. Um, code of conduct and expectations for all guests. Wash hands frequently with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, 60% alcohol. Um, if you feel ill, don't come to the show. Uh, never touch your face. These are all unenforceable. 
They are all unenforceable, and these are adults, and they should obviously know these guidelines already. But we are going the extra mile to uh, share with them all of the guidelines that they should be aware of when they're coming to an event. And then this is all from a panel of doctors, a panel of experts from the CDC, from the World Health Organization. That's where we got all of this information to provide to you today. Hi, Betsy. Nice presentation. So I have a couple questions for you. Um, at the chamber booth itself, I've, been, I've worked the fair for many years, and I've seen a lot of people at the chamber booth getting information and that sort of thing. You don't have any sanitation there. Is that something you might give some consideration to? We absolutely will. Um, we actually, at the chamber prior COVID, we, every single one of us as staff members had a huge bottle of hand sanitizer on our desks already because we shake hands all the time. So we actually do have hand sanitizers at the info booth already, but we'll make sure, um, it, like I said in the statement, for increased sanitation throughout, including the info booth. And because we've gotten rid of artist packets and because we're doing virtual check-in, we will not have the long lines that we've previously had at the chamber information booth. And then in your um, outline there, you said face masks while the supply lasts. Do you know how many face masks you're going to start out with. So if we end up having to have face masks, um, shouldn't you be prepared for? Absolutely. So I know an event that we had back in June in that small little window before we were able to have events, we had a small breakfast. I purchased 100 disposable masks. Um, I think I gave away three. And so I, people already came with their masks, but we will have thousands of masks available and are able to purchase each day. So if we run out on Friday, guess what? Friday night, I'll be headed to Home Depot and I'll be buying some more. So we will have more and more masks each day until our supplies run out. Was there any thought given to just stopping the number of vendors where you're at uh, rather than keeping it wide open and having more vendors show up at the last minute and increasing the, uh, the chances of uh, overcrowding? With the uncertainty of the proceeding of the event, we did not want to discourage artists from participating if we were able to do so. Um, as you can imagine, we've been planning this event since last February, and so we needed to plan with confidence so that we could get all of the pieces in place to proceed. Um, if we had put a limited number on the artisans and then everything had opened up completely, we would have really been putting us at a disadvantage, our local businesses at a disadvantage, the guests at a disadvantage. And so it's uncertain times right now. And so we did leave it open. That's correct. And then one final question. Is any of the cost of this going to fall back on the town of Fountain Hills at all for your ad additional security, uh, sanitizing stations, masks? No, we are completely independent. We do not get any municipal funds. Okay. Great question. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council? Well, we'll uh, start taking the card comments then. And uh, thank you, Betsy. And we'll see if we need to ask any more questions okay, afterwards. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. OK, first one is Sarah Nolan. Just in support, not to speak. Oh. You did say that. Okay, uh, then Dr. Michael Eisenberg. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, so I assume that all of you read the letter which I sent to the, the entire council. And I think the thing I would like to uh, emphasize are two points. One is that the recent data reported in the paper, uh, the Arizona Republic, and I have another source which indicate that things are not as rosy as the government makes them out to be. There seems to me from, from watching the news, there's a, uh, a disconnect between what, how good things are according to the governor and how other outside sources outside the state say things are, and they just simply are not the same. One source, uh, there was an article in the Arizona Republic just last week, which pointed out that <clears throat> the uh, one piece of data from the dashboard indicates that the Maricopa County rate of uh, infection is 55% higher than the national rate is. 
They also pointed out that the, the death rate here in Arizona is now the 10th highest of all the states in the country. And the overall infection rate is the fifth worst in the country. <clears throat> I don't know how the state is accumulating their data, but there's, there's just not the same reports. And I think we need to pay attention to that. My main concern about the fair is that I think you've, the, the plan that has been described is very thorough, it's very well thought out, but it's just simply not going to be enforceable. I don't know who the general who made the comment, but I think the comment that I recall, and I'm paraphrasing here, is that you can plan like hell, but once the war starts, all the plans go down the toilet. And I think that is likely to happen here. You're going to take 50,000 to 100,000 people, put them in a relatively small space over a three-day period, and getting them all to walk in a in one direction at the fair, uh, keeping uh, the people that go into the booths uh, to a small number is going to be very difficult. Uh, I can see all kinds of problems with the mask wearing. You know, we live in a very conservative state in a very conservative area, and a lot of people don't want to wear masks, period, for whatever reasons they have. And I can, I'm concerned that they won't be willing to wear them here, and if confronted by our security personnel, some really ugly incidents can occur because they simply don't want to comply. And um, it just it, once you get all these people in a space, I don't really, it's like trying to herd cats. I don't think you're going to be able to uh, control the movement of the people, their behavior, and we're bringing, you know, we don't know how many people are going to be bringing this virus into our town. We simply don't know. And I think uh, there's going to be a lot of people who will not be honest about their conditions. Thank you, sir. Um, that's my time. time. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, that is my main concern. The, the conditions are good, but they're just not going to be enforceable. Thank you. Uh, next is William Hines. Hi, Council. Uh, I'm William Hines. I think I know most of you. I'm a business owner here in town. I'm also the uh, chairman this year of the chamber, and we've had a rough year as a lot of businesses and nonprofits have. We took a very hard look at all of our events for the year. We know how important they are to the business community. And we canceled some, as you know. We modified some, as you know. And the ones that we really believed were safe, we've spent an incredible amount of time to put together a plan to make sure they're safe. We are, we are very concerned about the health and safety of our community, but we're also concerned about the business viability of our town. We're losing businesses, and, and we need to find a way to be good leaders. We need to find that balance between not doing anything. As a lender and a banker for many years, we had certain commercial lenders who said no to everything because they thought that was the path to never get fired. You'd never get in trouble if you just said no to everything. What happened was those banks died. So we're much like that. We need to grow our business community and we need to be leaders that make smart decisions. So I can tell you, Betsy and her team have worked for countless hours to put together a plan so that we can stand behind being safe. I can go to Target and be wall to wall with people. I can go to Fry's, I can go to Safeway, I can come in this room where we're all breathing the same air. We really felt this event being outdoors in a fresh air environment was as close as we could get to a safe place to put on an event like this. So I really hope you'll stand behind it. My business needs it, all the other businesses need it, and the chamber needs it. So. That's it. That's all the speaker cards I have. And then I also received several public comment cards. Thank you. Do you have um, a tally that you can give us that would combine not only the speaker cards from here, but also what we had gotten online? Sure. Um, the ones I, well, I got one other than the one lady. I got one other one in favor of it. 
And then the cards that we received online, we had one for and nine against. Okay, so that looks a little bit like, I think four to 10 just total, but obviously that it's just a small part. So, but we thank everybody who gave us their input. Um, any further, yes, Councilman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll talk a, about some emails that were received by me. I, I received the doctors. I responded to you and told you thank you for sending me that information. Um, also received an email um, comparing this event to Sturgis and then quoting a figure that 290,000 people were infected with COVID at Sturgis. And that's not true. Uh, the results were that uh, 177 to 193 people were infected at Sturgis, um, and there was over 490,000 participants. Um, I've attended well over 20 Harley-Davidson rallies, and I can tell you just by friends that attended the Sturgis event, they didn't wear masks. They were in a bar. The top three ways to catch COVID is in a bar. So to compare the art festival to Sturgis is not a good comparison. So um, also received an email from a resident who, um, because of two, last Tuesday's meeting uh, during the um, report from council members, I had said that I was pleased to hear that the chamber was going forward with this event. And the person that emailed me said that uh, I obviously was on the payroll of the Chamber of Commerce. So all my fellow council members up here Director Lavoie and everybody will know that there has been no harsher critic of the Chamber of Commerce at times than me. So it's laughable to say that I'm on the payroll of the Chamber of Commerce. I'm trying to make an informed decision that will help move the town forward, get this economy going, help businesses that desperately need help in this town. Um, the latest uh, statistics were that uh, today 248, I believe, Two, I wrote it, uh, no, 273 reported cases, one death. Um, the numbers keep going down. Um, so um, I just believe that I personally think that people are grown, they're adults. Um, we can tell them what to do, hopefully they'll follow it. I would like to say that um, a good number would be 200,000 people that would attend this, but I don't think that's a realistic number. Not at the present time, I think people, uh, I don't think you're gonna see those kind of numbers. I hope you do, but I don't think you're gonna see 200,000 people attend this. Um, also, it's an outdoor event. And um, if you have a core morbidity and you are susceptible to this disease, stay home. Buy your wind chimes another event. You can get them another time. Stay home. That's it, stay home. So um, I just wanted to address some of the emails I did receive positive emails, and um, I have talked to a couple of business owners who said that they're very much for it. Um, and uh, just one question, Betsy, um, you mentioned that this, um, there was gonna be stuff put on the street, um, stickers, chalk paint, and stuff. Should I assume that you guys will be responsible for removing all that after the event, the town? Absolutely, council members. Okay, will. okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Oh, Councilman Riddell. Mayor, I did some checking myself, too, um, along with what Betsy found out. Um, I know that Cave Creek is going to hold an event. Litchfield, as she mentioned, is going to hold an event. Scottsdale's got one on their website. I called the town of Scottsdale and talked to somebody who said they couldn't give me a de definitive answer because things are changing all the time. But she said it's a good probability since it's still out on their website. And Tempe also has an event listed on their website. Uh, that's the first week of December. So. Uh, other local towns are, ha are hosting events um, right around the same time we are. A couple of them are earlier, a couple of them are later. Um, I also spoke to a doctor today, um, and I asked him what his thoughts were on the town hosting this event. And he's, this is a doctor that's an ass assistant professor of family, community, and preventive medicine at a local medical school in Phoenix. And this is his quote. He said he felt that uh, the fair being outside would greatly minimize exposure and with the proper protocol and not provide a significant health risk to the people attending it. So that was his thought on it. So 
Um, I did do a little extra work on this and a little checking, and then we also found out that uh, some of the pro football teams are letting people into their arenas now, and so are some of the college teams. So again, they're not opening it up to 300,000 people like some of those stadiums hold, but they are starting to gradually open up, so um, I just thought I would point that out. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I almost hesitate to start talking about numbers or anecdotal sort of things because um, I was just in contact with a uh, coach at a college and their entire football season is now going to stop because they got, you know, almost the entire team tested positive. I also want to to look at, and this isn't, it's just, I just want to balance because that's what Bill mentioned, balance. Um, just today, we were at the 4% um, of the spread. The, the rule is to be at under 4% for two weeks straight, but last uh, Sunday, it was 5%. So I just want to, I think you all know that we all know someone who knows someone who, who has a different story to tell about uh, this terrible virus that has thrown us all into chaos and uncertainty. Um, but again, to get back to the balance, I, I know that there are other uh, events that we're talking about even as a town. And just because I have the ability to do this, I wanted to say that um, s some of the events that we do go forward with or that we attend, I think we all individually and collectively make decisions on what risk levels we're willing to um, uh, put ourselves into. So is it outdoors? That's a big one. Um, what's the crowd size going to be? What's the time of exposure? So is it, you know, is it the movie in the park or is it, you know, three days or is it Sturgis? Um, what, what sort of level of control do we have over that? So when we talk about the movie in the park, what are we going to do? What, when we talk about the turkey trot and those kind of things. So that, this is probably because I'm, I hear people say, well, if you're going to do one thing, why are you not going to do the other? Well, it's, they're very different situations and everybody makes a decision for themselves on that. So uh, it's not black and white. We all know that. Um, are there any other comments? I'm sorry? Yes. You have a comment? Mm -hmm. Okay, go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> One thing, which is, it doesn't make any difference to me what other towns are doing. My concern is what I was sworn to protect, which is the people of Fountain Hills. Um, and I don't, this is not an easy one. I don't blame anybody on the council or anyone else uh, for how they vote one way or another. I will say that, and a lot of you know this, I, post, I did a post um, on Facebook Connection, uh, which, and I sent one to, Be to Betsy in advance. Um, and the response, and anybody can go look at it, I haven't counted, but it's something like 20 to one against holding the fair. Um, let me be very clear. Um, like everyone else, I don't like the situation. It's what we've been dealt. And it's hurting everyone. It's hurting businesses, it's hurting school children, um, it's hurting absolutely everyone. Even people who are closeted at home, it's no fun, and I think we all understand that. I got an email that said I was being selfish. And I guess my response is, if wanting to protect the common good is selfish, then I'm guilty as charged. Um, in this town, the average age is 59. More than half of the people getting the virus nationwide are over 60. If you're over 60, my guess is, chances are pretty good you've got a pre-existing condition. Like my wife, who just finished six weeks of chemotherapy and radiation. This is very, very dangerous. Um, nearly half the states, I think it's 21 states, have seen an increase recently, and to my surprise, even New York is starting to see an increase. We aren't immune. The CDC by November said, said by November it could be a lot worse. Um, and that seems to be the, uh, the attitude of, of almost all of the scientists, that that's what they see coming. And all you have to do is look at Europe. Europe, in many parts of Europe, they thought everything was fine. Now it's bad again, very bad. Um, in Arizona, um, my colleague mentioned the number of cases per day, but if you multiply it out, Arizona's seeing nearly 15,000 cases per month. Maricopa County, more than 5,000 per month. 
And for deaths, we're number 10th in the country for deaths. That is the state of Arizona. Um, I, I said earlier, and I say it again, and I mean it, I admire Betsy and the chamber uh, for what they've done. I understand they're in a terrible, terrible position like lots of other people. Um, and they plan to take precautions. But I thought for a minute about the precautions. If I thought the precautions would solve the problem, um, then I'd be participating myself in the fair. But I don't think they will. We had a hearing, which some the council will remember, about two months ago on whether or not to require masks in Fountain Hills. Well, I gotta tell you, all hell broke loose. One woman jumped up and said, I have my constitutional rights. Another man came to the podium and said, I'm not wearing a mask, I don't care what you do, you can arrest me. And that was the sentiment for almost everybody out there. So the idea that we're gonna be able to enforce that and get people to wear masks, I think is, is, is misleading. Um, staying six feet apart, I mentioned that earlier. In a, my booth is 10 by 15. If I have four people in there, they're not six feet apart. I have tables with, with uh, merchandise on them and so on. It's not like you have 10 by 15 open space, you don't. So people are not gonna be six feet apart. They're gonna be breathing on each other. Um, touching the mer merchandise. I have mats. I get stacks of mats. People go through all of them. They're touching everything. I don't see these people using hand sanitizer before they come to my booth. Um, there's a question we need to ask ourselves. As difficult as this decision is, and I agree it is, which is more important, holding the fair or our community's health? Um, I side with protecting the community's health. Thank you, Councilman. Can I address one thing? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. So um, thank you, Councilmember Magazine. I do want to share with you, I know that you brought up Facebook. Our uh, devoted and dedicated staff at the chamber actually went through all 981 comments on 10 different posts on Facebook that were on five different platforms and Facebook pages. We put together all of that data, which brought us 17% in favor of the fair, 11% a clear no for the fair, and 73% of the comments were arguments, memes, and uh, did not speak to the fair at all. So the accurate, the accurate numbers is 17% in favor, 11% against. Thank you, I don't argue that at all. I was, I was just looking at one, um, yes. one site. Thank you, Mayor. I also had posted out uh, for comments from the public on the Fountain Hills connection, and I want to just share a few of the results of that, <clears throat> that uh, all uh, are still online, so all of you can verify my information. There were 76 uh, total that uh, wanted to have this fair and believe that uh, we should move forward with approving this permit. There were 31 that said no. Some of the comments that I thought were relevant that I, I think are important to bring up. Uh, snowbirds, with the, uh, you know, it's people with second homes, people moving here that are coming from all kinds of different states are all coming to Arizona. So we, we are all going to be subject to being at the grocery stores, being at events, being at any type of public uh, forums that you're going to be interacting with people that had social interaction in other states and aren't necessarily just isolated to Fountain Hills. I think we have to accept it as a reality that uh, this virus is not going away. This virus is not going to magically have a, a vaccine that suddenly you're going to be immune to and that everything is gonna be normal in life again. That's not the case. We have to accept that. The virus was around uh, when the fair was, uh, was in uh, February in 2020. It was already here. Some people say the virus was here in the fall of 2019. So this is something that, uh, in some of the comments, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my own comments and add to, but you know, the media and all of the uh, fear that is in our society uh, really escalated dramatically in the spring. 
And this was after the fair had already taken place in Fountain Hills in February. So if the virus was already here in February and we didn't have a massive outbreak, granted we'd shut down the state, but I just think that it's relevant to, to, to bring that up, that it was already here in February and there were, and there were plenty of events going on. Um, expanding the footprint, that was something that was brought up, I think, Council and Mike, uh, I think you brought that up. But uh, I think that's not necessarily a bad idea to look at this existing plan and, and try to utilize some of the space, maybe even some of the space in the park. If anyone has some, any major objections, if this uh, is not going to pass as just a straight vote to approve the special use permit, I would suggest we discuss the possibility of expanding the footprint so that maybe you have more space and we come up with solutions to try to figure out how we can make this happen, not how to, to uh, not vote in favor. Um, as, uh, as Councilman uh, Fridell had indicated, there's many events around the valley that are already still taking place. Tempe's having theirs, Litchfield Park, Cave Creek, Scottsdale's having many events. So uh, everyone is dealing with the fact that this is real and this virus is real, and everyone is accepting the fact that we can't shut down our economy, we can't shut down our, our way of life, and we have to allow people to have freedoms to do things and to enjoy life and to go to events that they feel that they want to attend. It, it's there, on their... Uh, they're on their own, they can decide whether or not to, they feel they're at risk. Uh, you make a good point, Alan, Councilman Magazine makes a point that uh, Arizona has a high, higher, one of the top 10 in regards to deaths. Well, uh, 70 plus is the highest risk category for this, this virus and, and the death rate. However, it should be noted, 94.6% survival rate over 70. Every other, every other age group, according to the CDC, is 99% plus. So while we're talking about and we hear the terminology pandemic, this is a virus that has, has numbers that are comparable to some of the high flu seasons that we've had. So this is not something that, uh, um, that if you get this virus, and this is the fear mongering, if you get this virus, suddenly you, you have a death sentence. My mother's 78 years old, she tested positive for this, and she had the virus, and she had quarantined for two weeks, and she's in Connecticut, and Connecticut is on a much more lockdown than, than Arizona, and she is uh, thankfully uh, survived without any issues whatsoever. Um, some people had mentioned the fact that why are we moving forward with potentially approving the art fair, but we are canceling all these other events? And I would agree with that. You know, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, I, I talked to Betsy today and I said, why aren't we having the parade? If we're moving forward with potentially approving a permit for the art fair, why aren't we having the parade? We've just now canceled the, the Halloween in the Hills. There's a lot of these events in town that uh, uh, I feel that uh, should go on and, and we should continue to make precautions and allow people to have the freedom the doctor uh, came up and spoke today. I read your letter. One of the things you said is we're not going to be able to control the people. That's not, I don't want to control anyone. I want people to have the freedoms to make the decisions themselves. If they feel that they want to go to a restaurant and they want to enjoy themselves, I am not going to be one on this council or for that matter any elected uh, position in the future to, to pull back someone's freedoms. That's not our role. I feel that our role is to protect the Constitution and protect the freedom that people have in this country. Uh, scare and fear, fear tactics, as I said, are real, and the rhetoric is just out of control right now. Uh, having movie in the park, we are going to have movie in the park, I understand, that's fantastic. Uh, farmers markets, all of these things need to continue. The businesses, as, uh, as the chairman Bill, Bill Hines had indicated for the chamber, businesses in this town are, are really suffering. and. Uh, I'm not the only one that's noticed that we have tremendous vacancies in this town and, and the vacancies aren't going to go away if we have a culture in this community that is anti-business or anti-working with business and anti-trying uh, to create an environment in this community for people to be successful. 
So I think that uh, Betsy, the uh, CEO of the Chamber, has done a fantastic job with her board. I think they've gone above and beyond to try to uh, work out all of the details to have safety precautions. I understand, and the mayor, you can comment on this, but I understand that it was conversations between yourself and town, town uh, staff in regards to eliminating the beer garden and eliminating some of the other amenities uh, such as entertainment for this event. I don't think that was, in my opinion, appropriate. I think those discussions should have taken place at this council. I think there could have been provisions to allow for entertainment and also allow for beer gardens. I don't think that was appropriate to put that stipulation on this chamber and to put the stipulation on those uh, organizations that rely on a lot of that revenue uh, for for their local um, for their local uh, charities and things of that nature. So, uh, I would I would. I would want to make a motion to not only approve the special use permit, but also to allow the CEO of the chamber and her board to come up with provisions if they believe that it's possible to have the entertainment, to have the beer garden, and to move forward with this art fair to try to make it as successful and as safe for our community as possible. Thank you. Is there a second for that motion? Second. I just want to mention that Maricopa County doesn't allow for the alcohol at this point, and um, they're still not allowing food or alcohol. I think there might be some wiggle room with some of that, but... Um, well, Mayor, commentary. Excuse me. Uh, I just wanted to be clear before we continue to discuss your motion with the amendment. My that, Mayor, clarify. I, mean, I said in my motion that to give the chair to give the CEO and her board the opportunity to discuss this and come up with possible solutions, one of which may be having an extension of premises to current local res restaurants in town that is allowable. So we have to give these businesses the opportunity to come up with solutions and be creative in how to move forward and have a successful event. That's what my motion was. Well, could you and we have a second. Well the, the motion is then, are you clear on the motion? Okay, thank you. Um, again, if we discuss this motion, we should be aware that Maricopa County is not permitting that uh, at this time. Clarify with that for us, Mayor, because I think what I said was to give the CEO of the chamber and the board an opportunity to discuss possibilities and how they could potentially have that. So I think that they would be able to evaluate what the rules and regulations are and determine whether there's any workarounds. Agreed, but information is information, and as we discuss this, we should know what is out there. Uh, Council, uh, Vice Mayor? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I understand the uh, thinking there. I just don't know on a practical basis how that would work in terms of, uh, I mean, I don't want to say carte blanche, but I don't, I don't see how the Chamber coming up with alternatives, how that would work in terms of coming... I mean, are you proposing they come back to this body? Or, uh, you know, we're given a permit here with some conditions that you're adding, like, oh, if it works, fine. But I, I, I'm comfortable with the original uh, approval that we gave at staff level and the conditions that the chamber already agreed to. Councilman? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I'm fairly close with the VFW and this beer garden that they have is truly the only large uh, money maker they've got for their entire annual budget. And I have to agree that if we can figure out how to uh, have 200,000 people come to town and if we can figure out how to keep them all going in the same direction, I would like to think that we're smart enough to be able to help the, cha the VFW continue to have their beer garden only if, and I think Councilman Tullis said it spot on, only if the chamber can figure out how to work it out with the county and figure out how to space it apart. I like the idea of, of maybe utilizing a, a little more of the property around the fountain. I like that idea, spread them out a little bit if you need to. If, if you need to, I'm certainly not going to give you directions on what to do or how to do it, but that is a good recommendation, especially if we can figure out how to also help uh, the VFW and the Rotary and all the different organizations that 
that this this uh, fair helps and and seriously the VFW it this pays most of their bills so I would like to at least give arts councilman Tullis's uh, motion consideration Councilman, uh, if I may uh, Betsy I have one question what is your plan on how to enforce masks like I mentioned, we will have announcements throughout the event. We have doubled our security. We will have it posted at every single um, event booth. And it's a Maricopa County mask ordinance. How is it enforced anywhere? I mean, if somebody is not um, abiding by the law, we will ask them to please wear a mask. Well, somebody walks into a booth and says, like the fellow did at the podium, I'm not wearing a mask. You'll have to, you'll have to uh, arrest me. How do you deal with that? We have 28 security personnel plus MCSO for the weekend. And as we do in any other fair, this will not be the first time we have someone unruly, unfortunately, at a fair. And that's why we have security. If someone is unruly, we call security. Thanks. Point of clarification, because we do a good enough job making residents mad. Um, we did not cancel the Halloween and we did not cancel the Thanksgiving Day Parade. So don't send us emails blaming us for stealing Halloween <laughs> and stealing the Thanksgiving Day Parade because we didn't have anything to do with that. Would you please tell everybody why that was canceled and Absolutely. it didn't have to do with this body? Yes, I would love to bring clarity to those two events. The Halloween in the Hills is, post, is hosted by Sammy's Fine Jewelry and Unique Gifts, a private business here in town. We are lucky to have them put on that event for over 10 years just as a service to our town. That was her decision and her decision alone to pivot and do a virtual type event instead. Um, they are great chamber partners and we support her in her decision with the uncertainties. I don't blame her, quite frankly. She just does it out of the nicest of her heart and it is a lot of work. Uh, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, we, the Chamber of Commerce, put on the Thanksgiving Day Parade. We love the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Uh, that was a very hard decision to make, and our Board of Directors voted unanimously to cancel the parade this year, and it was not because of COVID-19 safety requirements. It was 100% because people were not participating in the parade. Let me give you a few examples. One of the very favorite parade entries in our parade is the Fountain Hills High School Marching Band. Because kids are not schooling, had not been schooling together and were schooling at home, the marching band was not really in existence. Their numbers were record low. They were not able to participate in our parade this year. That was one of 65 entrants that were not able to participate in our parade this year. We had less than 10 who had said that they could and would. Most are nonprofits and they've not been meeting. So to gather all of a sudden to create a float was just not in the cards this year. So it was a difficult decision, but we did have to cancel the parade this year. Thank you, Councilman. Um, so, obviously, it's not a surprise that this entire time I've been focused on safety concerns about the pandemic. Um, the CDC guidelines that you are uh, referencing, you're careful referencing, and your obviously really strong intentions to enforce it. Um, we talk about maybe having 400 booths, maybe the mask will be gone by then. It's probably not going to surprise you that I'm 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 too reluctant and and will not be able to support it. I believe it will go forward, um, but given that um, we have a motion that included a possible beer garden and other accommodations, so if you are ready to take a vote on that particular motion, we can do that. And uh, if that passes, then we'll go ahead. If not, then we'll entertain another motion. And if it helps this council. Uh, in regards to their decision making on that motion, I'd be willing to add to allow Betsy and her board maybe a, a week, two weeks to come up with a potential plan to have a beer garden and determine whether or not you can meet the guidelines and have something successful. Would that give you enough time? 
Absolutely, but like Mayor Dickey said, the county is not giving any liquor permit. So we would have to, yes, I think a week or 10 days or two weeks would allow us enough time to find out if there's any other alternative through a restaurant, perhaps in order to support the VFW. We've met the VFW um, over Zoom three or four times, Paige, in order to support them. We're trying to do whatever we can to bring forth another avenue of income for them. Um, because, you know, we've worked with them for 40 years and we want what's best for them as well. So I appreciate the consideration. Thank you. Uh, Council, uh, Vice Mayor. So uh, shall we put a date? Oh, oh. thank you, Mayor. On that uh, uh, amendment, uh, would that be, would that give you a comfort level to allow for her to have some time to, to discuss with her board to determine whether or not she can come up with options? Maybe the... 12th of October that'll be two weeks from today yeah that's like to that's do. okay but what I'm, but of course we're gonna we're gonna be overruled if Maricopa County Board of Supervisors somehow says that that's not a goal it, and that's Betsy and her board that's their role that's their responsibility to determine what they can or can't do maybe they can work with a local restaurant or something but that's those discussions will be between her, her and board so i'm in that motion to add that date to allow her two weeks from today to report back to our town manager and then therefore if we need to have any type of additional consideration if necessary thank you vice mayor yeah i still <clears throat> have a question maybe it's for grady um as the situation stands now if a uh restaurant wanted to have an extension of premises for alcohol i've you know i've been to uh, colorado this summer in california and i've seen restaurants uh you know take over parking spaces and put up little uh, cubicle things with tables and such and uh, i assume that would be through the liquor department and they could achieve that now if they wanted to correct or well that's that's a good question so when we had the council um approve a number of the pandemic uh, business assistance programs. One of the items that the council approved was the administrative approval for the extension of premises. Our understanding, if I'm not mistaken, is that um, right now, um, the extension of premises would be for food only because the state liquor license control board has already approved their liquor licenses for the space that they already have on file. They would have to go through that and of course they have to demonstrate um, that they have social distancing and all the other things required so right now they're at a 50 percent capacity reduction for restaurants so, so it's so it's just a lengthy process then it's it's there but it's just lengthy or i or it's not there for I, alcohol i'm just telling you i'm surmising because i'm not familiar with anybody first of all i wish but we've not had anybody approach the town about an administrative approval of their extension of premises. So I haven't heard from the other side as to what it, it takes or what's involved with the State Liquor License Control Board to grant an extension of their, um, their current existing license to be beyond what's previously had been approved. Well, I mean, it has been over 100, so you probably wouldn't see any, but you know, maybe it'll start breaking here soon, but maybe, uh hopefully in time for the for the fair of course but so uh, you know I'm thinking that option kind of exists for for restaurants and stuff right now, right now. Yeah. and then uh, just to address the motion a little bit more I uh, you know I understand okay there's a date now I, I just think you know this council's already kind of going to bat for the chamber just approving the staff recommendation so I think to go beyond that I just I personally am not comfortable and I, I have a lot of great friends in VFW too. Trust me, and I know it's a big money maker. But um, I, you know, I just don't know if we've already made exceptions, and some people don't want this at all. So I think we're already working with the chamber. Thank you, Mayor, um, Councilman Mike. Uh, giving the the chamber board and the CEO the opportunity to explore options. And if they were able to come up with a solution that's a win-win for maybe the VFW, maybe one of the restaurants in town, maybe a combination of the two, inclu including potentially having some sort of entertainment, which was also part of that motion, uh, would you be against that? 
because I'm not here to solve their problem. I'm just giving them the opportunity to solve it themselves. Well, I mean, so they'd come back to staff at, by October 12th? Is they that what you're they'd saying? They'd come back and say, here's our proposal. This, this complies with the state mandates. This complies with the necessary requirements. And if it, re and if it complies, then why would we not want that? Councilman, um, Mayor, I mean, Mayor, my manager, do you think that the um, staff would want some input on any of this or do you, would you like some input on this? Well, I, I would like to just say a few things. So the reason why this was suggested in the first place um, is having actually seen and observed the beer garden area, one of the things that they're trying to prevent is congregating of people. I mean, what I mean by that is sometimes those areas are very full of people that are not related to one another there, um, there's crowding going on, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's just the nature of the event. And so um, the live entertainment tends to keep people there longer. So a lot of the age of the people that are hanging in the, um, the beer gardens tend to be the 65 plus in general. So that was the thinking behind that. Okay, Mayor. And I just want to say, too, to be clear that I didn't make this up. It was something that was presented to me that this could work if we eliminated some of the congregating, which included uh, music, yes. seating, beer garden, and yeah. maybe even food, but we'll have to see how that works. Mayor, I, I understand your logic and your thinking, and, and, and town manager, Mayor, I understand your logic and thinking as well. However, if they're complying with the rules and regulations, if they create an environment that they are able to have the social distancing that's required, if they have entertainment and if people go and they want to enjoy the music and they want to enjoy a beer or something of that nature, to say, well, the people that go are over 60 and they're at the highest risk, they know they're at the highest risk they know that they are going to this event. We cannot micromanage people's behaviors. We have to allow them to make their own decisions as long as what's, what's being created is in compliance with the county regulations. You know, to say that we feel that they're at risk and we're gonna shut them down is to say that we're not gonna have restaurants and bars in this town available to have entertainment. People con congregate. That's what's happening right now. That's exactly what's happening right now. So I, again, I think we're going on, we're, we are really going down a path of control of people and that is not what we should be doing. We should be creating the environment for businesses to succeed as long as they are playing by the rules of the county. And that's Betsy and her board's prerogative to determine whether or not they can make that happen. That's all we're doing right now as a council if we vote on this motion to approve is giving her the opportunity to see whether or not they can make this happen rather than dictate to her, you can't have entertainment and you can't have a beer garden. We're saying if you can do it and comply with the county rules and regulations, then we are going to accept that as a council and I think that's the right thing to do. I call the question. Okay. So we have to vote on calling so, the question, right? Need the second. Need the second. Oh. Dennis said second. second. Oh, oh, All in favor of calling the question, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we're going to vote on the motion. Um, and I guess we'll do a roll call. Would that be all right? Um, we will. Um, please, please, Liz, would you do a roll call for that? You bet. Okay, Councilman Brown? Aye. Councilmember Friedel? Aye. Councilmember Magazine? Nay. Councilmember Tolis? Aye. Councilmember Spellich? Aye. Mayor Dickey? Nay. Vice Mayor Charneau? Nay. Motion passes four to three. Thank you. Any other discussion or um, items to bring up? Motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. We're adjourned. All, all in favor say aye. Aye. aye.